Okay. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining today for our next uh, episode of the Primary Care Masterclass in Sport and Exercise Medicine and Musculoskeletal Health. It's an honor to welcome Dr. Lauren King today to join us, who will be speaking on providing personal uh, personalized advice in rheumatological conditions. And uh, we're really thrilled to be able to, to share this insight and information for you. And, and thanks for those to uh, have followed us all the way through this master class seminar series. Uh, before we begin, I just wanted to uh, acknowledge our land. Uh, we acknowledge here, I'm on the, uh, the lands at Western University, and we acknowledge that this is sacred land upon which we're privileged to live and work. We recognize the deep connection and longstanding relationship between indig Indigenous peoples and the land of Southwest Ontario and of London. We acknowledge the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Luna Paywick, and Chinomtan nations whose traditional lands we're gathered upon here today. And we're deeply grateful to have the opportunity to be in this place. So a few housekeeping items as usual before we begin. We've turned off the chat and we will be using the Q&A today. So if you have any questions, please drop them into that uh, section. And the other thing that you can do is that if you like a question that somebody else has asked, please feel free to uh, formally like it and it will go up to the top of the list for a priority sequence in terms of questions. This session is being recorded and it will be followed by a 40 minute presentation, then about uh, 15 minutes of Q&A. And the masterclass was developed with input from our scientific planning committee. So a big thank you to Dr. Eric Wong and Dr. Sadia Jan who've helped uh, form that committee as well. So I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker today, as mentioned, Dr. Lauren King. She's a rheumatologist and clinician scientist at University Health and an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine at the University of Toronto. Her research focuses on improving clinical care and enhancing physical activity for individuals with complex chronic disease and concomitant osteoarthritis. So welcome, Lauren. We're absolutely thrilled to have you. I'm deeply grateful for your expertise and insight in this particular topic, and the floor is yours. Okay, well, thank you for the invitation to speak. I'm just really thrilled to be part of this um, episode today. So um, the focus today is rheumatology. Um, and in terms of my clinical work, you heard a bit about my research. I'm a general rheumatologist at St. Michael's Hospital. So I do see um, individuals across, across the spectrum of rheumatic disease. So when I was putting some... Um, slides together, I um, decided to experiment with AI and images. And I thought this was the first one that came up with uh, physical activity and rheumatic disease. And I thought it was great until I looked at the legs and something was off, but I, I had more success in subsequent iterations and you'll see some, some images uh, uh, throughout the talk. Um, I meant to put up this slide around um, disclosures relating to these sessions. And then with respect to my own disclosures, I have no relationships with commercial entities. I do receive uh, research support from a number of institutions. Okay, so here are the learning objectives. We're gonna discuss the role of physical activity in the management of rheumatic disease, the barriers and enablers to physical activity, and then some approaches to consider around prescribing and monitoring of physical activity. And so physical activity, exercise, and therapeutic exercise are all um, very important in the management of rheumatic disease. I'm gonna be using um, um, all of these terms at times, and then at times default to the more um, uh, generalized uh, uh, physical activity terminology. Okay, here's an outline. And I'll get started with describing why um, physical activity is important in the lives of people with rheumatic disease, because I really want to instill in you um, really that why when you when you think about um, physical activity prescription. So we need to start with some definitions of what I'm talking about when I say rheumatological conditions or rheumatic disease. And of course, this is really broad. Um, I'm not going to be able to discuss every rheumatological condition today, but I'm broadly going to be referring to three main categories of conditions. So the first is immune-mediated inflammatory arthritis. And by that, I mean conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis. Second, I'm going to be talking about systemic autoimmune rheumatic diseases, connective tissue diseases, and the prototypical disease being systemic lupus, erythematosus, or we often just say lupus. And then the third, uh, osteoarthritis, which is the most common form of arthritis. And rheumatologists see primary osteoarthritis, but they also see secondary osteoarthritis. So individuals who have immune inflammatory arthritis may accrue some joint damage and some secondary osteoarthritis. I'm, I'm not going to be specifically touching on kind of episodic conditions, things like gout or pseudo gout, um, but a lot of the kind of advice and, and, um, or a lot of the issues that come up here will pertain to these conditions as well. 
Okay, so there are about 6 million Canadians who are currently living with arthritis and rheumatological conditions, um, including arthritis, are the leading cause of pain, physical disability and healthcare use in Canada. And among um, pretty much all of the rheumatic diseases, there are several similar elements and these characteristics are pain, physical impairments, and then across all conditions, at least to some degree, um, inflammation. And these characteristics can have down, downstream effects. And so that includes um, poor sleep, increased levels of fatigue. And then along with any chronic painful condition, there can be um, uh, increased risk for depressive symptoms and symptoms of anxiety. And so these might be things that you're, you're familiar with seeing in your patients. But there are some other characteristics that aren't always top of mind. And so um, among all the rheumatological conditions, or most of them are the ones that we're going to be speaking to today, um, they carry an increased risk of cardiovascular disease and all-cause death. So for example, people with rheumatoid arthritis have about a 50% increased risk of cardiovascular events compared to those without rheumatoid arthritis. And inflammatory cytokines are thought to contribute at least in part to this increased risk. In psoriatic arthritis, where there's a well-established link to metabolic syndrome, those affected have about it, or nearly 50% increased odds of developing cardiovascular events compared to those without. In those with lupus, so a multi-system inflammatory disease, the risk of cardiovascular events is about two times those, uh, two times the risk of that seen in the general population. In fact, cardiovascular events are the leading cause of death in people with lupus. And then even in osteoarthritis, which is a less inflammatory form of arthritis, our group and several others have shown an increased risk of cardiovascular events in people with hip and knee osteoarthritis. If you have two joints affected by hip or knee OA, you have a 13% increased risk of having a, a cardiovascular event compared to those with OA. And then the more joints you have affected, the increase this risk in a dose-dependent manner. And trying to understand why that's the case. Um, so we found that it's largely explained by uh, OA walking difficulty. So people suffer support difficulty walking, and that seems to attenuate the effect. And we think that's a proxy for um, less physical activity and increased sedentary time. So I like this quote that's on the Government of Canada website in the public health section related to the burden of arthritis. And I think it illustrates kind of this evolving understanding around the burden of rheumatic disease. My physician at the time told me no one had ever died of arthritis. In the years to come, he apologized a number of times for that remark. And I'm going to show you some, some data to really illustrate this. Um, Jessica Whitefield, using Ontario Health Administrative data, studied a cohort of individuals with rheumatoid arthritis of several thousand, and along with age, sex, um, and area-matched controls, and followed them for more than a decade, and found that the mortality rates in people with rheumatoid arthritis um, were higher than that um, than in the general population with specific um, standardized mortality rates that varied by, by age. And so what's driving that increased risk of all-cause mortality? So another study that was recently published that tried to answer this found that the effect was mediated both by estimated cardiorespiratory fitness and by systemic inflammation, here defined as a CRP level. Um, but the cardiorespiratory fitness seemed to have three times the effect um, than that of systemic inflammation. So you see, as I'm kind of feeding you some of this, um, I'm, I'm trying to set up a case um, for the ways in which physical activity might be especially important in people with rheumatic disease. Um, here now is in systemic lupus, erythematosus, um, the risk of all-cause mortality in people with lupus, about 85% um, higher than those without uh, lupus, and these are data from BC. And then finally, in people with symptomatic knee osteoarthritis, there's a, at least a 15% increased risk of uh, all-cause death. And this is an effect that isn't seen in people who just have radiographic changes alone. This is in those who have the symptoms of osteoarthritis, really showing that it's it's the illness um, and the burden of symptoms, the disability, um, that, that that's driving this increased risk. And in fact, Jillian Hawker's um, and so, some of her work has um, shown that among individuals with hip and or knee osteoarthritis, the worse you report your level of walking difficulty, the increased risk of all-cause mortality. And so again, underscoring how the, the pain and disability and, and uh, uh, impact on physical function really seem to be um, playing a big part, not just in some of the symptom state, but then again, in terms of um, uh, chronic disease complications and all cause death. So um, I hope over the last few slides, I've been able to make the point um, that people with rheumatic disease are at high risk of adverse health outcomes, including increased risk of cardiovascular events and, and even increased risk of premature mortality. Okay, so where does physical activity come in? Um, 
And so what's its role? So coming back to some of the shared aspects of rheumatic disease, um, so pain um, and physical impairments, as well as inflammation. So these um, not only contribute to the burden of symptoms, but then also um, um, play a role in this increased risk of cardiovascular disease and all cause death. And so physical activity has this important role in managing, um, in addressing some disease specific aspects. I'm gonna talk about that. Um, but then also directly um, seeking to, to mitigate or, or address this increased risk of cardiovascular disease and all cause death. So physical activity um, has an important role in acting through potential different mechanisms. So um, disease specific benefits of physical activity have been shown across a number of studies. So this was a systematic review and meta-analysis published in the British Journal of Sport Medicine um, that included 26 randomized clinical trials uh, of over 12,000 participants. And these were individuals with rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, uh, uh, systemic lupus erythematosus, dermatomyositis. And these studies showed a benefit um, of exercise on disease outcomes with small to moderate effect sizes. And I've listed the effect sizes as standardized mean uh, difference uh, on the slide. And there was high to moderate quality evidence for a small beneficial effect uh, of exercise on disease activity scores and joint damage. There was moderate quality evidence for a small beneficial effect on ESR, so a measure of systemic inflammation, although no effect was found for CRP. Um, and there was a small to moderate effect found for, for symptoms. Um, and in these studies, um, these included aerobic and resistance exercise programs, uh, and most of these interventions were um, for at least 12 weeks in duration. And these data don't suggest, and I'm certainly not advocating for exercise and physical activity being the primary treatment in people with inflammatory rheumatic disease. But there's an important signal that these, this is um, this um, exercise and physical activity can be important adjuncts to um, pharmacotherapy. I want to discuss two Cochrane reviews in osteoarthritis, so one for knee and one for hip, that examine the effect of therapeutic exercise on pain and physical function. Uh, for knee osteoarthritis, uh, results from 44 trials uh, show that exercise reduced pain and functional impairment with moderate effect sizes. So compared to um, control group, exercise improved pain and physical function with the equivalent of 10 to 12 points out of 100. For hip osteoarthritis, there were fewer trials. High quality evidence from nine trials showed that exercise reduced pain and functional impairment with small effect sizes. So after completing an exercise um, an intervention on av the um, average between group difference um, was uh, eight points out of 100. So there's a big chunk of evidence um, that's accumulated to show this beneficial effect of exercise over no exercise in people with osteoarthritis, and here I've shown the hip and the knee. It's not a huge effect, but it's consistently found, and this is, again, something very important to harness. A recent individual participant data meta-analysis um, looked at factors that might make someone with osteoarthritis who engages in a physical activity program more or less likely to uh, respond. So it was looking for the moderators of effect, and they found two baseline pain and physical function. And so those with higher levels or worse levels of osteoarthritis-related pain or disability benefited the most from an exercise program. So, so these might be particularly important individuals to target. Okay, so we've spoken a lot about disease-specific benefits of, of exercise and physical activity. So why do we um, why do we see these? So we don't know the exact mechanisms by which physical activity exerts in its effect in any given individual, but there are likely multiple mechanisms uh, at play, and we can make some hypotheses around what those are. So we can view um, rheumatic disease and control of rheumatic disease through a biopsychosocial lens, where we think about the biological and psychological and social factors and their complex interactions. And potential um, biological effects of physical activity included, include improving the strength uh, of the muscles surrounding a joint and providing better support for the joint, and also it, systemic anti-inflammatory effects. In terms of psychological and social benefits, physical activity can help address low mood, poor sleep, and fatigue that we know frequently occur in people with rheumatic disease and impact um, uh, the illness experience. And then physical activity can um, it can offer this important avenue for, for social support and connection. And these are factors, so social support in particular, um, can um, is associated with better chronic disease outcomes. So 
In addition to the role that physical activity can play in the control of rheumatic disease, I wanted to underscore its importance in restoring um, physical function and addressing physical impairments, because you can have a rheumatic disease that's under control, but you may not have function that's restored. So um, important to kind of think about these things separately. So in someone with, say, rheumatoid arthritis, they might have, you know, uh, onset of symptoms, and then there might be uh, a delay they present to care and then a delay to see a rheumatologist and then our disease modifying into drugs takes several months to, to, to. So it's not uncommon for individuals to experience um, substantial deconditioning um, by the time the rheumatic disease is under control. So with no tender or swollen joints. And so then rehabilitation plays this crucial role then in restoring function. Okay. When it comes to um, overall health. Um, so recalling there's that increased risk of cardiovascular events and all-cause mortality um, with, a, with the, you know, that can be driven by lower cardiovascular, uh, cardiorespiratory fitness, but also perhaps some degree from systemic inflammation. There's, there's good data to, to support the role of physical activity in helping reduce these risks. And um, while you may have discussed uh, these data um, or similar, I um, really just want to make the point that even moderate levels of physical activity can prevent uh, or can protect against cardiovascular disease and all-cause death. And here was a meta-analysis recently published in Circulation that found that taking six to nine steps per day was associated with a 40 to 50% decreased risk of cardiovascular disease compared to a uh, reference group of 2,000 steps per day, so those who were uh, inactive. Physical activity, even at moderate levels, can substantially reduce the risk of all-cause mortality, and so this figure is from a meta-analysis of 50 uh, cohort studies that included over 50,000 adults with um, about 3,000 deaths, and the Hazard ratios are on the vertical axis, the horizontal axis, that's physical activity measured in steps per day. Um, and then the bold lines are the hazard ratios. Uh, oh, uh, this is, um, right, the hazard ratio and the 95% uh, confidence intervals. And the uh, orange is those under 60 and the blue is those um, greater than 60. And so for those uh, in blue, so those over 60, there was a progressively lower risk of mortality that was seen um, from the reference group about uh, reference um, level of physical activity of 3,000 steps per day down to about 6,000 to 8,000 steps per day before leveling off. And for those who were under the age of 60, from about 5,000 steps per day decreased um, risk until about 8,000 to 10,000 steps per day. So these findings show the mortality benefits that can occur at uh, levels of physical activity that are less than that popular 10,000 steps per day that gets quoted. And for those who are inactive, every additional little bit of physical activity matters. And in fact, the greatest return on investment is um, going from really doing little to doing a little bit more. That's the steepest part of the curve. And I think these are really important messages and things to um to remember um, for people with rheumatic disease that you know doing something is better than nothing. So to summarize the 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 first part around role of physical activity, um, physical exercise has an important role as an adjunct therapy in people with autoimmune inflammatory arthritis and systemic autoimmune rheumatic disease, and as a primary therapy in individuals with osteoarthritis to improve rheumatic disease management, um, including. Um, lowering levels of pain and improving physical function. And that's in addition to uh, its role, uh, the physical role of physical activity in optimizing overall health, given the potential of physical activity to mitigate the increased risk of cardiovascular disease and premature mortality. Okay, so now on to barriers and enablers to physical activity in people with rheumatic disease. So, Despite the potential benefits of physical activity in people with rheumatic disease, it's still underutilized. And in fact, those with rheumatic disease may be more likely to be active than the general population. Here we can see data um, from US nationwide uh, surveys um, finding that those who self report a doctor diagnosis of arthritis were likely to meet physical activity recommendations compared to those without. Um, here you the results from the international cross-sectional study of people living with rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and really, unless you're in Finland, where um, 
uh, they seem to be very active. Um, the majority of individuals with rheumatoid arthritis were not engaging, so the solid bars being physically inactive, were, were, were um, not engaging in regular physical activity, um, but here was defined as at least 30 minute bouts. Across a, a range of rheumatic diseases, this cross-sectional study based in the US showed that a third of individuals um, uh, reported that they seldom engaged in physical activity. And those in this group um, were more likely to report worse levels of pain, um, poor sleep, uh, worse fatigue, and, and worse depressive symptoms. And then in a study using data from the US-based osteoarthritis initiative, and a subset of individuals who um, had accelerometry data, very few men and women with knee osteoarthritis met the recommended levels of uh, physical activity. So clearly we need to improve the physical activity in people living with rheumatic disease, um, although you know, easier said than done. So what might be some of the barriers to physical activity for individuals with rheumatic disease? And one of course, um, these are going to vary from person to person. I'm going to give you some examples of the barriers that, that come up. So many individuals feel that pain makes it too challenging to be active. Pain, like the warnings, you know, it's part of the warning system for all of us, right? We have pain when we do something, it, you know, our, our initial reaction may be uh, to stop. It must be harmful. And so um, as a result, there can be concerns around exercise. I fear that exercise is going to make, make things worse, their symptoms worse, it's going to lead to more progression. And we know that that's not necessarily um, true, but these pervasive beliefs um, are a barrier to engaging in exercise for, for our patients. Um, related to this, lack of direction from health professionals um, on what individuals can be doing, what um, you know they want to know what would be safe to do. Um, in the context of their arthritis or their rheumatic disease, and, and that's and so lack of um, lack of guidance from health, um, from treating health professionals has been cited as a barrier. Um, motivation, emotional distress, um, costs, and particular out of costs related to things like um, you know whether it's a gym membership or you know paying for um, a, a physical therapist out of pocket. Um, these can be an issue for for many individuals, and even access to safe walkable places uh, and having to negotiate some of the weather we experience in, in Ontario in the winter, the cold weather, the icy conditions at, at our site is very On the flip side, there are many enablers to physical activity, and, and these are things that we want to harness. And these include having um, prior experiences with exercise, like having to play the sport, getting some enjoyment um, out of it, um, understanding the benefits of, of exercise and physical activity. And, and so that's um, and, and crucial to engage in it. You have to know um, how to um, help you. Um, a resilient attitude and having support from health professionals in addition to social support have also been um, cited as, as key enablers. So are we doing our part as health professionals? Um, in the scoping review we did a few years back, uh, even in knee osteoarthritis where physical activity is a fundamental first line therapy, less than 50% of primary care providers and rheumatologists recommended physical activity to their patients. And key barriers for, for healthcare professionals included um, perceived lack of time, um, expectation that you know uh, patient um, adhere wouldn't want to do it anyway, uh, lack of knowledge and skills on how or what to prescribe, and the lack of uh, reimbursement around exercise counseling, and that it can take a bunch of clinic time to be able to do this um, uh, thoroughly and without um, appropriate billing codes, it wasn't really being incentivized. In speaking with my rheumatology colleagues, I think there's a perception too that there's a lot that we have to, um, there's a lot that we want to be doing for our patients. So in addition to kind of immediate um, disease control, there's thinking about this increased risk of cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular risk factors. There's about bone health given the increased risk of osteoporosis and a bunch of our the conditions that we manage about vaccinations, given the increased risk of infection, people on um, immunosuppressive therapy, and then finally physical activities and another. Um, another element that many might recognize as important, but it, it's maybe sometimes clear whose role it is to, to, to take this on. And in fact, um, 
the role of physical activity, the role of physical activity prescription and monitoring in people with traumatic disease was actually the subject of um, the great debate at our Canadian um, Rheumatology Association annual scientific meeting uh, a couple of years ago. And I, I'm not sure that we really resolved anything, but it was a really interesting uh, conversation. So prescribing, we kind of said that prescribing physical activity um, can be challenging for, for health professionals. And um, this is a quote from a qualitative study that um, we recently published. Uh, this is a quote, this is a family physician in Ontario, and this is relating to treatment of osteoarthritis. Um, but the family physician here says, I'm probably not the right person in the system to be spending all the time um, to do this, to be assessing and monitoring um, uh, relating to physical activity. That being said, I do want to highlight um, this Cochrane review, um, really indicating the important role that health professionals play with respect to, to exercise and physical activity. So this review pertained to patients with hip and knee OA, but the findings are transferable to um, the other rheumatic diseases. So here, um, what was really stressed was the important role that health professionals can play in providing better information and advice around the safety and value of exercise, providing um, exercise tailored to individuals' preferences, abilities, and needs. And then finally, uh, challenging some inappropriate health beliefs and, and providing better support. And those inappropriate health beliefs really being around, um, you know, still the perception that can be out there that exercise might be harmful to a joint. And, and you know, it, 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 it takes um, time and and um, to do this counseling to try to, you know, demystify these, these, these myths that, that have been longstanding. So clearly there are many barriers that we need to overcome. Um, and some are at the level of the patient, but also there are barriers at the level of the healthcare professional and at the, the health system. And with the health system um, also including, you know, the lack of universal coverage for things like um, physical therapists, I, I think is a, is a definite barrier. So in the final part of the talk, we're gonna discuss uh, prescribing and monitoring physical activity in, in, in people with rheumatic disease. Um, so first of all, um, you can and, and should use and should draw on the Canadian 24-hour movement guidelines as the basis of your physical activity recommendations for people with rheumatic disease. So if you take nothing else um, from this, drawing on these guidelines and then building and individualizing um, to the, the patient with rheumatic disease um, is, is an excellent um, starting point um, um, with, you know, um, realizing that these individuals may require some extra education, advice around joint pain, may need some added support. Um, for those with rheumatic disease, there's currently no evidence to support one type um, of exercise over another. And um, even though as clinicians, I think we, I think it's cognitively easier to have one therapeutic agent at a single dose to whip out of our back pocket. I think this lack of evidence for one specific disease or dose or intensity over another right now is really an opportunity for us, an opportunity to tailor our recommendations and work with um, you know, the uh, person living with rheumatic disease to come up with a, uh, a, a regimen and, and a plan that um, they're most likely to enjoy and adhere to in the long term. I like this statement from the, the guidelines. I think it's really important to emphasize that any amount of physical activity will have benefits, even if, if physical activity guidelines aren't met. So there are some overarching principles to draw on when it comes to physical activity for people with rheumatic disease and um, publish recommendations. Um, uh, and the citation is here. So these are um, recommendations published in ULAR or European League Against uh, Rheumatism. And we've spoken already about the first two. So physical activity is key to optimizing overall health. It can help symptom management and and this is with a view to improving health-related quality of life for patients. And um, the third principle is that all types of physical activity, so aerobic, resistance, flexibility, and neuromuscular are safe and appropriate for those with rheumatic disease. Um, and, you know, which one to emphasize, that, that can be individualized um, uh, to our patient. And then finally, the planning of physical activity should be a shared decision between the healthcare professional and the individual with rheumatic disease and take into account people's preferences, capabilities, and resources. And then, so, so the final statement there really underscores the health professional's role in providing that support and helping to individualize the physical activity plan to the person living with rheumatic disease. So I'm gonna go through um, 
three cases that are, um, this is really um, an oversimplification, but you can see how perhaps some of these points come up. So the first case is um, a 47 year old uh, woman. Uh, she's a teacher with seropositive erosive rheumatoid arthritis diagnosed a couple of decades ago and currently maintained on sotalizumab. Um, and she has inactive rheumatoid arthritis. And so she had um, quite active disease in the past, but, but um, um, currently inactive, but then she does have some joint damage and structural changes related to her rheumatoid arthritis. Really right now, the main part of her symptoms, or what's most concerning to her is her pervasive fatigue. She finds it too challenging to work full time. And she has some fear around activity. She's worried that physical activity just might make some of these symptoms worse. She, it might make her more fatigued, too wiped out to be able to do anything. And she's working part time right now. So for her, she wants to, um, she wants to get back to working full time. She wants not to feel so fatigued. She wants to get her endurance back. Um, she wants to feel stronger. And then also when, it, you know, she's a um, middle-aged woman, um, we're also together thinking about her risk of cardiovascular disease and premature mortality and, and, and really, you know, ensuring that her overall health um, is as, as optimized as possible. Things that I kind of we consider when we're coming up with a physical activity plan is that well she's a teacher and she has extended health benefits and so you know that means we might have she's very fortunate in terms of some of the access to resources and, and we might um, leverage those. Um, we have to think about her bit of anxiety around exercise and so we're going to have to um, uh, provide education that that's that's tailored and that can overcome that barrier and then also recognize that she had um, you know. A, a long time with quite active rheumatoid arthritis, really struggled to get under control until she got on her current therapy. And so she'd been quite, uh, she's quite deep conditioned at the moment. And so um, we're going to have to counsel her around um, the kind of um, progress um, that, uh, and really normalize that it may take some time for her to kind of meet her, her goals. And that's totally okay. So we've already spoken about um, the importance of education and reassurance here. We're going to, you know, um, accept and expect that the, the progress is going to be slow. And, and that's totally and um, that's totally fine. It's not a failure by any means. Um, ideally, um, you know, we spoke about incorporating both aerobic activity and some resistance exercise. And that's what she's working with a local physical therapist to, to build on a general um, conditioning program. And then I try to do my part in terms of having um, instilling some accountability by asking about physical activity at each visit, ensure that she is adequately um, supported. The next case is a 43-year-old woman with systemic lupus erythematosus and was diagnosed um, in 2012, um, uh, then under control, and then had a flare in 2021, and currently treated with steroid-sparing therapies of mycophenolate mofetil uh, and hydroxychloroquine, in addition to a taper of prednisone. She's kind of at a, at a, at a low dose at the moment. And her lupus is inactive, uh, and right now she um, feels well, and is working full time and she engages in brisk walking about 30 to 45 minutes daily. So the goal here and what we speak about is maintaining her excellent physical function. Like this is great, you're in your forties, let's keep this up. And we know that, you know, if somebody is working full time and they're a parent to a number of children, you know, and life events can come up, it might be easy, it, 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 it might be understandable and we all might could, could imagine how this could happen as you could fall off, uh, off of the routine. So we wanna ensure that she engages in her, her physical activity, um, both from a, um, from a cardioprotective point of view, but also she has been on exposed to quite a bit of prednisone. She's still on prednisone, think also thinking about her bones uh, um, with respect you know, to prednisone and risk of glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis. So we're emphasizing with her um, just ongoing engagement with her aerobic exercise, adding resistance exercise as possible. And again, um, from a rheumatology perspective, I just wanna make sure I'm, I'm also adding that, 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 that accountability it is in the checklist of things that we go through uh, at each visit. And then the third case, a 78 year old woman with osteoarthritis in both of her knees, uh, insidious onset, gradually progressive over many years. She lives on her own. She wants to continue um, living on her own. She enjoys her, her, her independence. Um, she lives with multimorbidity and takes medications for her cardiovascular disease for her knee osteoarthritis uses topical diclofenac. And she 
um, engages in very little physical activity. For her, she gets predictable activity related pain, and she's kind of self managed um, by uh, avoiding activity um, because, you know, she says, as she says, it hurts to walk. So the goal with, with her really is she, she, we want to improve her pain. Um, and we want her to be able to live independently and continue to engage in, in valued activities. And so considerations are that she doesn't have extended health benefits. So she's covered by Ontario drug benefits only. Um, her low level of baseline physical activity. So again, thinking about um, what kind of progress uh, we might uh, um, expect. And then also really, really importantly is she gets pain with activity and we absolutely need to address that um, so that she feels that she can engage in physical activity. So approach, um, so she went to the Good Life with Osteoarthritis in Denmark program. So this is an osteoarthritis education and exercise program that's rolled out worldwide. And um, it's ministry covered at my hospital and at, at other sites, people would have to pay out of pocket. So if she didn't have access, um, then I would send her to Arthritis Society Canada's Arthritis Rehabilitation and Education Program that is ministry covered. So she would have access to um, a physical or occupational therapist to assess her. Um, and then we discuss pain management around physical activity. So um, with her, we elected to, to do corticoid injection in, into both of her knees for more short-term pain management while she engages in the physical activity program. And then we also have a discussion around um, that some physical activity is um, with exercise is okay. Um, it's not going to be harmful to your joint, and we just have to provide that uh, reassurance. So I want to underscore the importance of teamwork and drawing on local resources. So I spoke briefly about uh, GLAD. So it's an example of, for osteoarthritis, a education exercise program. It's six to eight weeks delivered by trained therapists. And uh, you can go to the GLAD Canada website to see all the locations where it's delivered. Um, Private physical therapy is always uh, an option for those who have uh, the resources. I think one of the um, key things around that is setting up expectations. So in the prescription, I might write a referral for private physical therapy. I'll make sure I, you know, it's it's around exercise um, uh, recommendations and titration. And I also counsel the patient, well, this is not going to be about passive therapies. It's going to be about active active therapies and getting you going and helping almost to coach you through a physical activity program um, within the context of the rheumatic disease that you have. Um, there is oh, um, funded physical therapy, but my experience um, has been, even for those who are eligible, like those over 65 or Ontario Works or on for DSP, um, the, the, uh, the programs and duration is, is, is quite limited and the choice of where to go, it, it's, it can be quite limited as well. And then I also briefly spoke about the ERA program, or Arthritis Rehabilitation Education Program, run by Arthritis Society Canada. So in Ontario, this is a ministry-funded program. Um, there are referral forms online. They will see there are occupational therapists and physical therapists with additional training in rheumatic disease. Um, and so uh, referral forms online, patients can also self-refer, and I think it's a really, really wonderful uh, resource. You can consider using other tools, so pulling out a blind prescription pad and, and um, you know, writing out a physical activity prescription. Here, I've just given an example of using the FIT principle or frequency, intensity, time, titration. Um, but I, I like this resource here also from uh, the Canadian 24-hour movement guidelines found on the webpage, and that also can be used as the basis for physical activity counseling and prescription for people with rheumatic disease. So we're getting near the end of the talk. Um, so I wanna go through some pitfalls to avoid. So what are some pitfalls? Um, first, not explaining the role of physical activity. So knowledge is really empowering. And so for people with rheumatic disease, living with you know complex chronic disease and perhaps pain, really understanding the purpose is important. Um, second, not explaining the, the time frame for improvement. And so, you know, some of you may have had people come to you and say, well, I did physical therapy and it didn't work. Um, only to kind of un later understand that you will, person went for one session, did exercise for like a day and they didn't see benefit. And so, you know, we have to kind of um, set um, the expected time frame. This will take weeks to months, um, but you know, it will be worth it. Expect slow and steady progress and think of all the additional benefits that you're gonna get. 
Um, next pitfall is not elucidating patient goals and preferences. And that's going to be crucial for individualizing the physical activity recommendation. And, and also, you know, really, this is about promoting long term adherence. And so making sure it works for that given individual. And um, next is um, not understanding the resources available for a patient. So we can't just write a prescription for, for physical activity and then go because again, not, you know, this isn't something that's universally covered in, in Ontario. And we, you know, sometimes I feel like I'm, I'm just trying to match people to the resources, um, to the resources available. So this is just kind of a, a reality of, of being able, we know that working with our, with other health professionals is very important, but it's about figuring out um, just how to, how to make that work. Um, Next is not discussing pain and pain management. And um, so even the reassurance that, you know, it's okay if you have, if the pain gets a little bit worse with physical activity, as long as it comes back down and you're back to baseline in 24 hours, you know, that's absolutely fine. Pain with activity is not causing any damage to your joint. And so um, uh, that reassurance um, can, can go a long way. And also figuring out the timing of pain management. Do we need to do anything to make sure you're okay to get started um, with a, a physical activity program? Or even if, you know, for instance, if someone taking an analgesic, like, um, like a non steroidal anti-inflammatory, thinking about the timing of that. Um, and then finally, you know, final pitfall is not considering the behavioral change required. So exercise and physical activity is a behavior a series of behaviors. We really have to recognize that there are, are many things that that go into to that behavior. And, you know, how can we do our part, whether it's around monitoring and providing feedback and sources of accountability and et cetera. So we've spoken about a bunch of things today. And I meant to leave you with some takeaways. So first, physical activity is crucial and recommended for people with rheumatic disease, for disease control, for rehabilitation, and um, for whole person health, including mitigating that increased risk of cardiovascular events and premature mortality. We need to recognize that there are a number of barriers. Um, and these are at the level of the patient, health professional, and health system. And um, you know, we have to try to overcome what we can here to promote uptake and engagement in physical activity. Um, and then finally, um, you can follow the Canadian 24-hour movement guidelines, but think about individualizing your recommendations and, and working with the individual patient and specific disease factors and patient factors to provide the best support for these individuals living with rheumatic disease. So I want to thank you for your attention, and um, I'd be pleased to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Lauren. That's fantastic. It's re it's really nice to see, first of all, how pragmatic and practical the advice is, because essentially, I think a lot of us uh, in in various specialties struggle a little bit in the sense of um, normalizing physical activity a little bit, and also just addressing patient concerns and also those provider barriers as well, which you really outline uh, very nicely. So. Thanks for providing that insight and, and certainly some resources that I was writing down throughout the, the oh. talk as well to, to promote for my patients. Um, so, uh, you know, over at that osteoarthritis stage, absolutely. So thank you for that. Um, I, I know I have a question in terms of, we do have a question about uh, slides. So I thank you to the attendee who was just asking about a copy of the slides. There will be, this will be recorded. So you'll be able to access the recording. And sometimes we do offer some PDF handouts, but we'll get back to you in terms of uh, that. Uh, specific questions that I had as um, related to some of the questions that I have um, from patients and other providers as, as well is, just that perspective of, um, I think one of the reservations we have as physicians is uh, any kind of risk or liability that we might not be thinking about. So from the rheumatology lenses, do you find that there's anything um, from an absolute or even relative contraindication that you suggest either be from a you know an active flare or maybe blood work perspective or things along those lines where you would say, it's still great, but maybe not now, or maybe we wait? Yeah, it's a really important yeah. question because, right, we're, like, we're supposed to do no harm, right? So we we, right. we don't want to um, put our patients in any position in, like that. And in fact, I was doing a, a qualitative study with health professionals who treat diabetes to understand, you know, do they um, 
what happens when they see OA in their patients, so knee osteoarthritis in their patients, and do they what do they recommend? Are they worried about giving exercise for their for individuals with diabetes if they also have arthritis? And that did come up, right? That sense of well, I'm not sure what they should or shouldn't be doing, so maybe I avoid prescribing for fear of doing harm. And okay. so um, when it comes to people with arthritis, we're not they're not like starting CrossFit programs, right? The, these right. are m most often we're getting people have um, been doing not a lot because one they've been had a lot of pain and joint inflammation and they've modified their activities um and or you know on the other hand by the time someone's seen a health professional for their osteoarthritis we know that they've 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 you know there are various myths about you know you should be avoiding activity and all of that so a lot of times we're dealing with a population of people who are really quite quite sedentary and so we're talking about things like you know walking 10 minutes a day hasn't been shown to flare up um people um arth you know arthritis symptoms you can start with 10 minutes of walking a day so when i when i think about prescribing something like that there are very few precautions or contraindications to starting someone walking if we get to the other end of the spectrum that someone is very high functioning we're talking about really high intensity stuff i'm so happy that we're that we're, that, that we're there that it would be fine to wait and check something out if someone has some cardiac symptoms no problem but for the vast majority of individuals we're trying to get them to do that, that's something, that steepest part of the curve, going from nothing to something. And there are very few precautions. And specifically with respect to arthritis, even an inflamed joint, it may be stiff and and, and hurt, but you you can, you know, um, it's not going to be harmful for the disease point of view to, to go for a walk on it. Excellent. Yeah. Because I think one of the, the other parts that we get from patients, for example, in, in a lot of conditions similar to OA, uh, I mean, obviously most of the patients with rheumatological conditions, I would refer onwards. But for those that I see with osteoarthritis, for example, and other pain syndromes as well, the question always becomes, well, if I, I can't because I'm in pain or how much pain should I be able to tolerate that's safe? And I sometimes pull out this kind of arbitrary, you know, on a scale of one to 10, you know, if you're kind of two to three out of 10, this is okay. Just don't let it ramp up or watch that it's not too bad the next day, modify or whatever. I feel like that evidence that I give is based on clinical experience, sorry, the, the advice I give is more based on clinical experience or having feedback from patients and things like that. But I, I'm curious as to whether or not there's the, the kind of advice that you might give in that specific situation. I mean, and essentially there, there might be more robust evidence out there to give more guidance related to, to pain scales in general or perception of pain when you're, when you're counseling patients. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. So that's, it, this comes up all of the time. And okay. like the first point is like addressing pain is, is important. We have to provide some reassurance and, and, and about that. Um, about what to recommend. Um, I'll often, if somebody's really sedentary, I might just normalize it. Like, you know, if any of us weren't doing much and we went and like ran a marathon tomorrow, we're like, we're gonna be really, it's gonna cause a lot, like we're gonna be really sore, it's gonna be really hard. Um, so we have to work with your starting point, make sure, sure that we're not doing something that's causing, that's, you know, it's gonna take a while for you to build up for to whatever goal it is that the person wants to do. So let's just be really cautious and let's start with just a little bit of activity. And I think, you know, I think that'll be, you know, and we kind of agree that it's unlikely to flare up a lot of pain. So just making that those little tiny little um, small steps um, where someone can feel confident because a lot of it's about self-efficacy too like I don't think I could do that that would cause too much pain I'm going to be wiped out afterwards um so let's start with something like super simple I find that's really hard with people who are young because they often have an identity around um being able to do a lot more physical activity but we're kind of saying nope that, that's just we're, this is where we are now let's do something small around the guidance about how much pain to tolerate I use the same thing and I'm not sure where maybe where it comes from the kind of two to three out of a, down a numeric rating score um and just like, you know, because it just gives people a sense that, okay, you know, as long as it doesn't go absolutely bonkers, the pain, like a little bit, okay, I can accept that. I'm, I'm you know, it, 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 hopefully people won't be, it won't worry people when it happens, but I like it to come down afterwards and at least within 24 hours for it to people to feel normal again. And if, if, you know, when people often tell me, well, I, I went for a long walk and then the next day I was completely wiped out and I was in a lot of pain. Well, it's like, okay, well, that was too much for you at that point. Let's try to do less next time because that was just, you know, too much pain. But, you know, over time, I think you'll be able to get there because I want to create positive messaging around people will be able to achieve their goals, but we just might have to go slow and, and be guided by, you know, the, the feedback that their body's giving them. Excellent. Excellent. 
That's great. I think, and, and too, I, I know, so on, kind of on the other end of the spectrum, and, and you can mention this a little bit, so in terms of people who may want to say, okay, I <clears throat> that maybe this is a wake-up call or a life-altering event or a diagnosis that has changed their perception. Maybe you have patients that uh, want to go to the other end of the spectrum in the sense of, okay, I'm going to set this goal and I'm going to be doing this, you know, I'm going to run this marathon in six months or something along those lines. It sounds like you have very good realistic advice to give them and provide in terms of follow-up and, and essentially a bit of coaching in a way. I was just curious in the sense of, do you ever have people who have said, you know, I, I've seen the role that lifestyle might have, be it exercise or otherwise, and say, I'd rather do this and take medication, or for example, or those kinds of questions where you have um, potentially looking at head to head, uh, you know, in terms of exercise as an adjunct to treatment, perhaps versus replacing medicine together. I'll give you an example as I say this, because I in, in mental health literature, for example, um, there's it's often cited about uh, looking at exercise um, that is as effective for mild to moderate depression as medication itself. So there's a bit of, in terms of those physicians who are trying to prescribe exercise in different conditions, um, how do you look at the role of medication and alongside exercise? Is it something that kind of promote together or, or I'm sure there's very many individual cases out there, those kinds of things, but I just wondered if you had any guidance or thoughts about that concept of maybe not versus medication, but how how you um, might counsel a patient on, on those two topics together. Mm -hmm. And it, it gets really, um, it, you know, we can't lump all rheumatological conditions together. So right. there's, there's, so there's individuals who will come in and say, you know what, I, I'm a person who prefers to avoid medication. And if it's someone with osteoarthritis, I kind of say, great, I have a great treatment for you. And in fact, when we look at, you know, lots of studies and, you know, meta-analyses of uh, randomized clinical trials, we know that there's a, a good, good chance, you know, that, that there's a moderate effect sizes for, for exercise for say knee osteoarthritis. And in fact, the effect sizes we see are uh, as strong or stronger than that we see with non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. And, and that's kind of the best pharmacotherapy that we have for osteoarthritis. So um, when it comes to knee osteoarthritis, we can, it, um, we exercise has, it's, it's right up there with um, disease education, exercise, weight management, um, and those all get lumped together as core first line strategies. And so there's a lot of discussion around exercise um, in that context. When it comes to someone with, let's say, rheumatoid arthritis, so they have an inflammatory polyarthritis uh, and high inflammatory markers. And if somebody says, well, let's, uh, I just want, can I, can I manage this with diet and exercise alone? And so then we'd have to say, well, you know, um, these things can play an important role in supporting, you know, your overall wellness and the treatment of your rheumatoid arthritis, but this is an immune dr driven, you know, uh, uh, it's an autoimmune disorder. There's nothing that you've done about it, but you know, exercise isn't going to be able to get at the dysregulation in the immune system. So it's going to help with all of these other things, but we're also going to need medication. So we, we can talk about them together and they are important together. And um, I'll have to say, practically speaking, in a rheumatology clinic where we're, if we're seeing somebody with like a very active rheumatoid arthritis, probably the priority will be on initiating disease modifying therapy, having all the counseling around that, and there'll be less counseling around physical activity at a first visit or, or the, the initial visit. And then once as the room, uh, as the rheumatic disease is coming under control, again, using the example of rheumatoid arthritis, then we start, you know, emphasizing more time gets spent on physical activity, um, because we're working on them getting the function back and ensuring that they're living healthy lives to, to you know, to allow for the best outcomes for our patients. Excellent. Okay. And so I, that's really great to hear because I think, um, so in terms of follow-up and uh, when that physical activity conversation happens, do you note uh, in terms of follow-up when you're asking patients about their experiences with physical activity, potentially as an adjunct or something um, uh, beyond uh, their disease modifying medications, do you, do you find that they generally enjoy it or they tend to feel better? I mean, subjectively and in, in, in your practical experience as well? 
Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. People who, who have able, who are on a physical activity um, regimen, um, because there's these, all these other living with rheumatic disease, isn't just about having a swollen joint and having joint pain, right? You um, individuals are more fatigued. Um, sleep is poor, more likely to have depressive symptoms. And so um, we think about the whole person and their kind of global assessment of how things are going. Physical activity can play a really important role um, in in that. Um, so um, yeah, um, for sure. And um, it's really, how do we harness that for the individual person in front of us where there are different potential barriers and, and enablers, um, you know, we, you know, there's always, you know, would love to be able to, you know, bottle it up, um, right. but it takes work, but it, there's definitely the, the payoff. That's great. Yeah. It's nice to have that, that feedback for patients uh, for sure, in terms of uh, it, it's, I, I've thought that, you know, I'd love to be able to have uh, patients, especially as they've gone through really positive experiences with physical activity, even if they do incur, uh, encounter setbacks or obstacles to be able to have that discussion with other patients as well, because I think some, sometimes that uh, uh, really does, uh, once you have that patient voice, it can really add to the discussion and, and our interpretation as well, in terms of what we, how we need to counsel and uh, certainly has changed my perspective and, and even just the way I counsel on physical activity. So it's, it's really nice to hear that. Um, I don't see any other questions. So I, I would just wrap up with one more, if I could, just for a minute or so. Um, as, as you spoke to some really interesting statistics about rheumatologists um, prescribing physical activity as well as primary care providers. And um, just in terms of your thoughts on, um, do you find that your colleagues do prescribe physical activity or do you find that they, they have the training to do so. I, I mean, one of the things we've often advocated for is more of this understanding of physical activity, counseling, education in medical schools and residencies and so on. It sounds like it's not a terrible percentage, right? I've heard worse, um, but I just was wondering your thoughts about um, how you see practically if, if that conversation's changing, do you find that there's certain, um, you know, you, you mentioned the great debate, uh, do you think this is coming to the forefront a little bit more or and or do you see kind of um, uh, ways to go forward in terms of training of our future physicians, particularly in your specialty? Yeah, so it is definitely becoming top of mind. Um, it's uh, but, you know, having, you know, finished rheumatology training in 2019, there, there was very little education um, and specifically geared towards the rheumatologist, towards how do you incorporate this um, in your practice. So, you know, you don't, it's it's not like your education finishes when you finish um, residency or, or fellowship, but people, um, you know, so it really is left on the um, the health professional or the rheumatologist to seek out some additional knowledge and skills to be able to to do this. Right, this isn't um, a large part of the curriculum, um, if at all. So that's why there is going to be variability across rheumatologists at, at how much this is emphasized. I think um, another point is, you know, over the last couple of decades, our um, when we're talking about um, inflammatory, autoimmune inflammatory arthritis, our treatments are really good. We have biologics and JAK inhibitors, these advanced therapies that have really revolutionized the management um, of uh, autoimmune inflammatory arthritis. So now, you know, we we have treatments to get people under excellent control. And so when we're following up, we have this opportunity then to work, it, it, providing that their disease is under control to work on all these additional things um, that, that affect whole person health. So um, I, I think this will be increasingly, um, I think this is, is seen as important and I think increasingly so as our therapeutics get um, so good that now we have this opportunity to work on all of these, maybe things that might've been considered peripheral in the past, but now um, it's just because, uh, you know, in, in the like nineties, um, that th we just didn't have the same treatments as we do, as we do now. That's great. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Lauren. I think um, just from the perspective of you, you've taken us through a lot of the theoretical mechanisms that I think a lot of us were unaware of and biological explanations, mechanisms of action, of exercise. It's really fascinating to see how physical activity can affect various uh, aspects of systemic inflammation, but also very specific to different rheumatological conditions. And thank you as well for giving those practical recommendations, because I think regardless of specialty, a lot of what, what you mentioned today really hits home for a lot of us in terms of how we can provide specific counseling to our patients and actionable steps for us to bring to our, our clinical practice. So 
Thank you very much for, um, and it was really an honor to have you speak on this today. You know, I've been following your work for a long time and really inspired by all the things that you're uh, you're involved in. And uh, certainly thank you for bringing along these pearls to our audience today. Oh, Jane, thanks so for Oh, thank you. Yeah, so with that, I would just like to wrap up our, our session as well. Thanks to everyone today who's been able to be on the call. Um, please do send um, the, uh, oh, you're getting some thank yous from our attendees as well. So thank you for that. Um, please, for those who are attending, uh, please do send uh, your um, comments and questions. If you have anything uh, beyond this presentation, please do so. Make sure that you're filling out your uh, evaluation forms. The link is in the chat as well to receive the certificate for the uh, CME. And and please also, uh, you can email Kristen Riley, who's put her uh, address email address in the chat as well. So uh, until next time, we will have a, another masterclass coming up soon. We have two more left before the year is done. So we appreciate uh, everyone's attendance and encourage uh, more discussion in these specific areas. So thanks again, uh, Dr. King, and uh, to everyone attending today and have a great day.